Welcome to the Start of Grind. To Ben Silverman, come on up. Welcome. Thanks. You should pick this up. You get whatever you need. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Is that good? Okay. So just, uh, just keep it close. And can you hear us? Okay. Is the is the sound all right? Okay. Um. Well, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Long drive? Not a long drive. <laughs> um, so tell us, Ben, tell us a little bit about, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us about, you know, kind of uh, your, your, your parents. Were, were, you, were you raised in technology? Tell us about kind of where you grew up and some of the things that, uh, about your uh, kind of early years. Uh, sure. So um, uh, as you mentioned, I grew up in Des Moines. Um, I don't know if you guys, anyone here is from Iowa. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Des Moines. Um, my folks are both doctors. They have a family practice. Um, actually, both my sisters are doctors as well. So actually, growing up, um, I just I always assumed I was going to be a doctor too. Um, and yeah, I, I think that um, my parents are really open-minded. They're really curious people, but we definitely didn't uh, were really into technology. I think uh, my dad my dad still has a big stack of like VCRs that he uses. Yeah. He refuses to go. <laughs> Digital. He's like, he's like, uh, it's not safe. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my. Background. And you, and and so were you, like, were you fascinated by different things? Were there, were there, were you a tinkerer? You're not, you're not a, a co you're not an engineer by trade, right? But, but um, what, what kind of, what was your thinking? What were you? Did you think you'd you'd end up after? Did you go to school thinking you'd be a doctor, or did did you did that change along the way? Where did that change? Uh, yeah. So I, I went to school. I thought I was going to be a doctor. Um, as a kid, I was really into nature, and I was really into science. So I worked in worked in labs growing up. Um, I don't know. I collected like leaves and insects uh, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and I think that I was just going through college, just sort of assuming I'd be a doctor, not really thinking thinking that hard about it. Um, and I think around my probably between my junior and senior year, I realized that maybe maybe I didn't want to be a doctor. And I think if there's ever if there's ever a job that you should be 100 percent in on it's definitely being a doctor. So I think at that yeah. point it's just sort of like lost at sea. And did you did you were you planning to do pre med? I mean, had you was that your major? What did you what did you study at Yale? Yeah, I mean, I'd taken a lot of the pre med classes, um, all the science classes, um, and then I was also really interested in political science. Um, I just think it's really cool that you have all these people in the world and you can create these sets of rules that help them sort of coexist. It's like an operating system for for people. Um, so yeah, I, I was really I was really interested in political science as well. So you um, so you take a job out of college, you're doing some consulting, and what what kind of ch at what point did you shift, or what was your thinking, and you know before you ended up at Google, what what was going through your mind as you were making that that shift? Yeah, so my first job out of school was um, it was a consulting job in Washington D.C. Um, and I was in the tech group because that's where there were openings. Um, and I, I thought I thought technology was really cool. Um, it was really dry stuff that we were working on. It was kind of corporate B two B, like IT infrastructure, disaster recovery plans. Um, but I remember back then, um, Web two point was just happening um, on on in California. Actually, I remember the day I found this blog. I was like Tech Crunch. I was like that's such a ridiculous name, but I was I was so excited about it. I just thought it was really cool, and I just really felt. I felt like the story of like my time was happening kind of in California and, and I just wanted to be part of it like it, in a little way like it didn't have to I didn't have any specific plan I just wanted to be closer to something that just felt really exciting um, and it reminded me of when I was reading like history books and like there are these big things that happen in history and they usually happen in a place um, I just wanted to get out there and, and check it out when we had Tony Conrad here he compared uh, what's going on in San Francisco or in the valley right now to like what happened in the Renaissance, like, which seems like a very, you know, glamorous way to put running a startup. It's like, oh, you're in the Renaissance period of the modern age. It's like, really, Tony? Maybe you are. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like in the favelas of the Renaissance. Um, but uh, what, what? So, so talk about what as you're at Google. What, what did you learn from Google? What, what, um, what about that mentality and, and that culture um, kind of helped you get to that next point? 
yeah, so Google was awesome. I mean, I felt so lucky uh, to work there. I, I was in OSO, which is basically customer support and sales. Um, and for me, it was, it was just super exciting. I, I think every once in a while I hear people complain about companies like Google or Facebook, and I'm just like, oh, it's so obvious you've never worked anywhere else. <laughs> I was like, this place is awesome. I mean, um, and I think there were, there were a few things that, that I really remember getting excited about. Um, I think the first is that it was the first company I'd been to that, that thought really big. Right? Google thinks, uh, and they think about things at a really grand scale, and, and they have they have this sort of opportunity to do that. Right? They, have, they have this huge cash machine that lets them fund all these amazing ideas, but it was still really cool that instead of reacting to an idea emotionally and being like, oh, that's too far-fetched, people would sort of break it down and really think, like, what's the rate limiting factor there? So I thought that was really cool. Um, Google's also really idealistic. Um, I, I don't know if I even really realized how philosophical that company is, but especially at the time that I joined Google, I felt like they, they were trying to make the internet exactly what I loved about the internet, right? They, they had this idea that information should be free, that the geography shouldn't matter, that um, a few people could build things that make the whole world better, and, and I really loved that. I thought that was just really cool. So I felt super excited to, to work there. And, and talk about what, what, types of, what types of products, what, what, did you, what did you work on while you were there? Yeah, so um, at Google, the products are so big that when they say you're on a product, it's actually like a feature of a feature of a product. I was in the ads group. Um, I was working on a bunch of things, but a lot of display advertising products. Um, so um, my, my products were often things that don't seem like products. They didn't seem like products to me, but they might have been pricing models on how the ads are purchased or um, simpler interfaces for making it easier to spend money. Um, so definitely definitely not things that, I don't know, anyone dreams, like this is, this is why I'm gonna you're, work yeah, in you're tech. Up at 2 a.m. thinking yeah, about it. But at the same time, it was, it was super exciting, right? Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know, I mean, still, even though it was like thousands of people, I felt like, oh, I was you know, this really small part of helping to make this whole big company make money, and I thought it was, I thought it was cool. I mean, I felt, I felt, and I still feel super fortunate, because they, they totally took a flyer on me. Um, I was totally unqualified, and I only realized that more and more as I worked there and met the kinds of people that they hired. Um, so I, I'm super grateful for that opportunity. How many people in the room have worked work at Google or have worked at Google at some point? I have a few, okay. There's so many startups and there's so many, uh, uh, Jared in the back from Wealthfront, Matali's at Twitter and there's, I mean, there's so many people that have benefited from that kind of education, that experience and, and it spawned, you know, tons and tons of startups. Um, so talk about, so you're at Google and, and talk about your your kind of, what, what, what was going through your head at that point? Did, were you starting to come up with were you starting to brainstorm ideas? Did you have one particular idea in mind? Were you just kind of getting a bug to, to do something more? What, what, what happened? Yeah, so I, I'd always had like all kinds of things that I wanted to, to make someday. Um, and I think the one thing that was frustrating for me was I didn't have an engineering background in Google. It's just really hard to work on product without an engineering background. And that's not by any fault of theirs. I mean, they have sort of an embarrassment of riches. They have like so many brilliant engineers that you don't need to give a flyer to like a political science major who came from a consulting firm. Um, it'd, be, it'd be ridiculous, right? Um, so I think part of it was, it's almost the feeling that you're so close to this thing that you really want to do, but you're not really doing it necessarily in the way that you want yeah. to do it. Um, and then the other thing was that my, my girlfriend um, at the time, like now my wife, we, we moved out together. Um, I had met her uh, in DC at this consulting firm. Um, she also just, at one point, just called me out. She's like, you always talk about wanting to do a startup. Now we're in California, right? Like, I support you. All your friends are doing startups. And then she was kind of like, you should either do it or just stop talking about it. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, I really, like, I'm really also fortunate for that. Like, she, I mean, she totally, she was like, what's, she what's stopping you? She pushed you to do it. Yeah, she's just like, either do it or like, seriously, like, just shut up about it. Um, and sometimes I think you need someone to give you a little bit of a push. Um, so. Yeah. And so, so you, so you, did you leave Google with an idea in mind, or did you leave like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just jump and f figure, grab a parachute on my way down, or what, what, what was it? Um, so I, I just sort of left, um, and 
uh, it was actually terrible timing, objectively. It was uh, 2008, so but before Bear Stearns had come <laughs> come apart. Um, and I worked on a bunch of things. You know, I worked with some friends at Stanford. Um, actually, ended up being back in a biology lab. It was really funny because um, I just didn't want to be like <laughs> alone. Um, and that was a really great experience. Um, and then I hooked up with a buddy of mine from, from college who was living in New York at the time. Um, his name is Paul, and we were working on um, an iPhone application together. Uh -huh. This is 2008? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I definitely didn't have like a, a fully baked plan, just sort of like hit the ground running. Um, so, yeah. yeah, and you, you, when we were, you, you kind of like, you guys were everywhere, right? It was, it, like you're saying, like you, you you worked in different offices or coffee shops. So you'd said to me earlier, like you've you've worked or done work in so many different places. It was, I mean, probably no different than a lot of people in this room. You know, just kind of trying to figure out what you're going to do and and maybe not having a specific direction at the moment. Or when 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 did at what point did you start to kind of did the idea for Pinterest start to really come together for you? Yeah. So I mean, not working yet. We worked wherever, right? Like um, you work in your living room for a while. Uh, at the time, Paul was in New York, um, so I was like basically alone. And I work at coffee shops. I worked at like the Hacker Dojo. I've been to like every. I've been to every coffee shop. Uh, like I, I remember, uh, I opened my computer. I was having trouble getting on a network. Had all my old network keys, <laughs> and it's literally, it's like the wireless network key to every single coffee shop between, like, Mountain View and in, in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, so we had been working this iPhone app, and basically we couldn't we couldn't really ship anything that was that high quality. And uh, at some point, I, I just um, I had this other idea for a site built around collections because I was a big collector as a kid, and just decided to start working on it. And um, I was at the time flying back and forth to New York, and hooked up with another one of my friends, Evan, um, who is a graduate student uh, in architecture actually, and. We just both got really excited about the idea. We just decided to sort of take a run at it. And where, so, in, in in terms of taking a run, where where did you start? Did you because your co-founders as well are not engineers. You, the three of you are not actually trained engineers. You have a friend that that was the architect, but did you start looking for? Did you, you know, reach out in your network, try to find people to work with and partner with? Um, did you did you guys outsource initial prototypes? What what did you all do for? Um, your code. Yeah, so we we worked with a lot of people, <laughs> actually, um, with with varying levels of success. And um, at the time, we also we needed money, and this was a really really tough time. It was a t tough time for talent because the there was no funding, and so if if people were on the fence at all, they were just staying at their jobs, um, or they they were financially secure, and they were like, I'm going to do it myself. Um, it was a tough time for money for obvious reasons, and so. Um, I mean, we did the tour. Like, yeah, we met with met with everyone. I mean, everyone that would take a meeting. Like, <laughs> I cold call people out of alumni directories. Yeah, um, we met with everyone. This is with a live product or a prototype no, or no, nothing. It's a prototype, and it was a pretty like, it was a pretty it was a pretty rough process actually. Um, I think that someone was like, "Oh, why'd you do it? Did you know it was a really awesome idea?" And I was just like, "Gosh, it just seemed too embarrassing." now that I had left my job to tell all these people like, hey, like it's been a few months, can I get my job back? So um, <laughs> that was actually a big, big motivator, which isn't like the most, uh, not the most awesome <laughs> motivator. Oh, that's a good motivator. Yeah. So I, I, we, I interviewed Naval Ravikant, who's the founder of Angelus last week. And, and, and I asked him, I said, did you, did you get pitched on Pinterest? And he said, he said, yeah, I did. And he said, Ben came highly recommended. And he said, and he kind of like sat back. Who knows Naval, or who's familiar with Angel List or Naval? Just one, a very humble, really one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And he just sat back and he was like, they came and they pitched and I was like, Penny? Like, what is that? <laughs> and uh, and he, said, he said, you know, I just, he said, I just didn't get it at the time. And, you know, my bad, you know. But, <laughs> but, but it seems like he, he, I mean, he's one of the smartest investors in the valley and it seemed like it was just why, why was it such a difficult concept for these guys to grasp why 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 didn't people jump on it um so i don't know i mean naval was in really good company actually uh everyone passed yeah um <laughs> and i think it was i think it's a few things i mean first of all i really um 
I mean, I wouldn't say I sympathize, but but investing is hard, right? Like, I don't know. You, you you're looking for all these um, like really vague signs. It's too early to have good data on it, and everyone has all these theories. But it's it's really hard to know like what's going to work and what doesn't. And I think that for us especially, people really didn't understand the concept of the product. So even the first version of the product had boards and repins and pins and profiles, and I don't know if it's because we didn't communicate it well or if it just wasn't how people were thinking um, of products at that time, but it just it just didn't really resonate with folks. And then we weren't helping out any with like a team of pretty non-technical people that, um, you know. So I mean, I don't I don't really fault fault anyone, um, but yeah, it was it was it was a really tricky tricky time for us. So so when 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 did you actually launch the first version of the product, or at least? Where you were signing up users that weren't your your friends and family, yeah. So let me think. So November two thousand nine, okay. we started building it. Um, yeah, my my wife came up with the name over Thanksgiving. Like, uh, um, we sort of started inviting a few people in January and February, and we never we never really did a big launch. Uh, it was it still is invite only, but it was invite only back then. Yeah, I emailed like a uh, hundred of my friends and. Just Four of them it. signed up. We had we had terrible numbers, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, um, when you've you've said you've said this before, but would love to just hear about it. Like, you said you were stealth, but not you didn't mean to be stealth. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, um, people just a lot of people weren't just grasping it, and I think there's a lot of really good writing in startups about um, being really diligent about data and iterating really quickly. On, on things if early data doesn't work out. And I think that that's really good advice, actually, but we didn't have the engineering resources to do that. And I really liked the product, and Evan liked it, and Paul liked it, and so we just thought, well, we'll just continue sort of, sort of working on it. Um, so, yeah, it never, it never really popped in California, actually, at all for the first year and a half. Um, and so talk about... Um, um, Talk about how, how did you, what, what was the first point where you actually started to get even a little bit of traction? Was it months later and what, what kind of drove that? Yeah, it was, it was a few months in. I mean, it's funny, we, we just hired a couple guys that are working on our data, so they're pulling through our old log data. Yeah. Uh, and one of them pulled through the early data, they're like, wow, that was, that was bad. <laughs> like, like, like four months in. You're like, like at, you're fired. We're at 200 users or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that the first people that started using it, there were two sort of groups. Um, one was people who I grew up with, actually, um, in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of a lot of folks really enjoyed it. And then I went on a whim to this conference um, in Utah, where there were a lot of um, a lot of people that were out of the creative industry, so interior design, um, and a lot of those those people used it as well. Which is funny because as you now look at it, like the the key demographic is like people. Women from the and you correct me if I'm wrong, please. It's like women from the Midwest and Mormons. Like those are the two demographics, which, like Iowa and Utah. So, yeah, I think uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of really smart people in Silicon Valley about um, this idea of like early adopters, right? And I think that I think the whole idea of early adoption has changed a ton. Uh, I mean, a few years ago. Sure, like if you're into technology, you, you bought like a smartphone that other people didn't buy, or you you paid more because you like technology for faster internet. But now, I mean, everyone, a lot of people at least, have really nice phones. They have Facebook and the app stores on Android or uh, the Apple phone, which you know basically are the biggest distribution channels in the world. Um, so I think that products will find their markets a lot more smoothly and this idea that it's gated through Silicon Valley I think I, I just don't think that's as relevant anymore because the average amount of exposure um, and access people have to technology into the primary distribution channels is just really really different so I think you'll see lots and lots of products that seemingly come from other places but to me that makes that makes total sense um, Facebook has 800 million users now meaning 800 million people have been trained to create a user account, to contribute content online, right? They understand that idea, and that's that's a really big deal. I mean, um, I think that's that's a bigger change that actually hasn't quite sort of 
soaked in, uh, I think, in, in Silicon Valley. So, um, so you, you're working on this. At, at what point did you start? So you have 200 users for the first few months. You do this thing in Utah. You, it's, it starts to kind of seed a little bit in Iowa. And then, and then what happened? Did, it, did that just kind of like work itself very slowly throughout 2009? Or um, you, you, you ran, in particular, you ran a, a program with a bunch of bloggers at, at one point, right? Was that soon thereafter or was that at the same time? And what? Yeah, I mean, the site grew by the same percentage, like pretty much almost every month for, for a really long time. And it's just that the initial number was so small that it wasn't really on anyone's radar. Um, and yeah, we did a we did a sort of program with a bunch of bloggers. Um, Victoria Smith, who's a blogger out of San Francisco, we we organized this event where we invited a bunch of people to create pin boards about themselves, and then they could invite their friends to do the same thing. Um, so it was an event that was very core to what the site was about, um, and it's it slowly started started to pick up. Um, but yeah, I think that we never did any press. Um, we were pretty explicit about never wanting to do press. We still really rarely do, um, probably to our detriment detriment now. But I think we were just so busy, and partly the personalities of the founders just like wasn't our cup of tea that we never we never called up like TechCrunch or Mashable as like a launch a launch strategy. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was good or bad. You can't. Maybe we'd be Seems ten like times maybe okay, we'd be ten yeah. times bigger. But you can't really run those tests, you know. Right. Um, I think people sometimes just look back. And they're like, oh, that was critical. But you can't A-B test like an invite system or whether you call up TechCrunch. So I have no idea. But I will say that we had a lot of confidence that the early people that used it really liked it um, because they basically heard about it from someone they cared about. Uh, and they were using it a lot. Yeah. So. And the core, the core features of the site that exist today, it, those were all in from the beginning. Is that right? Yeah, the basic architecture was, I mean, there was a lot, there's a lot of detail work that goes into that. Um, so Evan, who's led up the design and deserves a huge amount of credit for the success of the site, um, I mean, we worked really hard on the initial layout. Like a lot of people now are like, oh, everyone has sort of grid layouts with um, horizontal constraints and vertical constraints. But when we designed the site, that was actually one of the really early sites that did it. Um, and I want to say we, we, we coded like 40 or 50 versions of, of that grid. Um, and really crafted that because we felt like that was one thing that was different that people would notice and it mattered a lot. So I think before I'd worked with a lot of designers, I sort of thought great designers were just, they were just aesthetic people and they just like spit out like beautiful stuff. And maybe some designers are like that, but, but Evan grinds it out. Um, and actually it's sort of the philosophy of the whole team. People, people really grind out those designs. So, and we still do. So, you know, that grid is, I think, you know, we tried it at 192 pixels, 200 pixels wide, like metadata on the top, on the bottom, like with color, without color, with shadow, without shadow. And you're testing all this stuff? Like are you A-B a -B testing that stuff or just kind of like judging user feedback or when, when you're making those changes? We would just use it and we just try to use it on a lot of devices. So that grid, um, it's not perfect. We're still sort of updating it, but it worked pretty well on a 13-inch screen, on a 15-inch screen, on an iPad on an iPhone, it's it scaled pretty gracefully um, without doing too much to it. And for us, that was an area where we thought, why don't we just over-invest in one thing that people really notice? Um, and and I think that, that really actually was important for us. It, it's sort of how we continue to run the company today. And so throughout 2009, you still haven't raised money, or did you raise money at, at some point? No, so we ended up raising, um, we raised seed round um, first from sort of angel investors that weren't really that closely connected to the Silicon Valley tech community, and then later um, from some angel investors that were more um, more connected here. Um, so I think those those angel investors out of out of that community, especially the former entrepreneurs, so um, Kevin Hartz um, from Eventbrite and, and Max Levchin and Michael Birch, I think they were really, to me, formative in, in the site because they kind of... I don't know, for the first time, these people that have built obviously awesome companies are like, oh yeah, you know, this could be really big. Yeah. And uh, that made a big impact to me. I was like, wow, like I have no business talking to that guy. <laughs> and, and he thinks that it's gonna be big and, and he's putting his money where his mouth was. Yeah. Um, and that was really, that was really actually important, I think for the whole company to sort of think a lot bigger and, and hold ourselves to a much higher standard for what we thought um, we could build together. So one of the really unique things too, I think about 
this this whole story you're describing with pictures is that you guys never like you stayed true to your original vision you never really pivoted and there's it seems like there's so much pressure that if if you don't get you know a hundred thousand downloads in the first month you know wow what are you doing wrong you know keep moving keep moving so what what through that process in those early months what was the driver for you in the team to say hey you know what yeah our metrics are, are bad but we've got a really compelling vision here let's let's stick with it yeah you know, I, I don't know exactly like I, I think that question is when, when do I keep going and when do I pull the plug that's really hard um, but I knew I liked using the product and I had this small group of some friends and some family and they liked using the product and we also knew that the product as it existed was like a very crappy version of what we wanted to build um, and so we just kept trying to make it better and better um, but that's a good question, and, and I don't have like a concrete answer to that. Um, I think a lot of that actually has to do with the personality, your personality, and the personality of your co-founders, and whether you have money, and whether you're feeling pressure to like feed your kids. Um, all those things come into play. I think there's a lot of like luck and happenstance um, in that whole process. Was there was there any was there ever a point where you guys got very close to just saying, "Hey, you, you talked about that earlier," where you know you you had thought about going back to Google, but was there was there ever a point where you guys actually got very close to making that decision to to just doing something else or giving up? Um, so I don't I don't think that I got that close to it. Um, you know, one of the really nice things about living in Silicon Valley is that there are so many other people that are going through exactly the same thing with you, right? So I actually feel like Silicon Valley is the easiest place to be running a struggling startup. Like you go to barbecues, everyone's congratulating you all the time. They're like, congratulations, like you don't have a job anymore. <laughs> um, and that's one of the reasons I moved out here, actually. I mean, that's not the case in other parts of the country. You know, you, you go do something and a few months later, like, oh, how's it going? Like, how are you doing with that? Uh, are you worried about it? But here, actually, it's, it's really celebrated. And, and to me, to me, that makes a big difference. It means a big difference, like when you get drinks with like a group of people that are going through exactly what, what you're going through. And I think that's why so many people end up here. It's not just that there's a lot of money and there's a lot of engineers, but there's a whole community of people that are really supportive and, and genuinely yeah. want to see you succeed. So, so you roll into 2010, you start to get some investors, and do you start, at, at that point, again, are the numbers still quite low, or, or does it start, your engagement was always, with the users that you had, was always very good, right? But... Uh, or was it not? Was that something that ramped up, or, or was the engagement, you know, always impressive, even though you only had 200 people using it? You know, engagement was always pretty solid, and you know, as I said, like the site grew by the same percentage every month. Um, so, the site was was generally growing. There were weeks when you know it would stall a little bit, but usually it was pretty easy to know what was going on. Like, um, I don't know, it was like a holiday weekend, or there was just something pretty obviously different. So, the numbers continued to go pretty well and so it was 40 or 50 percent um, so it was it was growing really quickly and, and that's the thing about kind of services that spread either through word of mouth or virally right the larger the base that you have the the, the faster it grows and it accelerates and so um, so you're going through 2010 your team is still is still what it's the three founders and is it a couple of engineers? Is that is that the team, or who was the yeah, team? Yeah, it was like point? four people. Um, I mean, Evan Evan uh, actually took a year and worked at Facebook. So he was working part time nights. Wow. Um, so he had started in grad school and moved to Facebook. So it was pretty small, and um, it was fun actually. Like we used to work out of a house um, on Ash Street, so like three blocks away. Yeah. On California Avenue, it was like this tiny house, and. Um, the office was in the front, and one of my friends lived in one of the rooms. He was doing his own startup, and the co-founder lived in another another room. Uh, it was a really small house, and it was it was hilarious. Like we'd be in meetings, and like uh, my friend would like roll out in his towel like eleven. Um, like don't mind me, just taking a shower. Um, yeah, it was it was really fun, you know. And um, as I said, I think a lot of it is being out here um, and and being around people that you respect and other people respect that are like what you're doing is really great. I think if I was living in Washington D.C. or my hometown, and I'm living and working in a house with like two dudes that are living in the bedroom, and not, really, I mean, I don't I actually don't yeah. think it would have been. You would have been planning fun. a terror attack or something. It wouldn't, right? I'm not sorry. No. Um, 
what, uh, what t talk to, so the first, my first exposure to Pinterest was, um, I tried to figure this out today, but I couldn't when she actually joined. But one, one night I'm sitting on the couch, this is like almost a year ago. And like, I'm like grinding on my site and I look over my wife's computer. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why aren't you on my site? Like, <laughs> it's not targeted her at all. Right. But it's like, and she's, and she's like, oh, I'm on this thing called Pinterest. And I'm like, what, what is Pinterest? And it just felt like, and she's like, oh, and she went off. And I was like, how long, you know, and she'd been using it for, and it was like every night. And then I started paying attention. It was like literally every night for four hours while we're watching TV. She's like, she's like going to kill me. She's in here. So there she is. She's just, um, but she's, you know, she's on, she's on Pinterest and, and pretty soon all of her friends are on Pinterest. And it was like this, this very extremely, extremely viral thing. Finally, I, I joined, you know, a few months after that and, and I've been, you know, loving the, you know, the, the hairpins and the, um, you know, the recipes ever since. But <laughs> were you guys, were you guys always very aligned with Facebook and, and was that, did that fuel the growth or was, was, at what point did you add, add Facebook into the mix? Uh, we used Facebook Connect from the beginning. Um, I don't know, to me, so Facebook is actually one of my favorite products. I, I love it. Um, and the reason I love it is that I feel like it connects me to real friends and real family that I care about. I, I don't know, it's fine. A lot of people I meet here are a little cynical about Facebook, but I almost can't even get my head around it. I'm like, <laughs> like, how can you be cynical about your like grandparents and your nieces and nephews? Like, that's that's what I see in my Facebook. So, there was a parallel in that one of the early goals of Pinterest was to help you feel closer to these things that you were passionate about. We used to say like the goal of the website is to get you offline and to get you to go do these things that you've always wanted to do. And we thought a good starting point for that was Facebook, which you know had um, and I think still does the most, uh, the identity platform that's most closely tied to the things you're doing in your real life. Um, and also Facebook's huge. I mean, it's just a, a huge platform. Um, I think for a lot of people, Facebook is the internet. And I don't know if that'll last forever or, or anything, but uh, we were really excited to work, work on that platform. What, what um, so let's, let's talk some more about the product. What, what do you think were the most, important things about about the product that you guys decisions that you made and and how how early did you make them you you guys you talked about working on the grid for 50 revisions for two and a half months or something you guys just churned out and cranked on the grid but what was was that the, is that the most important thing that you guys did was was do that or what what was the most important product decision you guys made uh, I don't know I don't know what the number one was actually um, we were pretty obsessive about the product. Like we were obsessive about all the writing, like how it was described. We were obsessive about, you know, what boards should it try to start you with to give you an idea of what the service is for and what it isn't for. Um, we were obsessive about the community, right? We would, I, I think I personally wrote to the first, like five, probably five, 7,000 people who joined the site, um, asked them what they thought about it. Um, and, and I don't know, it's hard for me to know exactly which of those things was helpful or wasn't helpful, but I don't know, I think the one thing that, that a lot of us had in common is that we just wanted to build something that we were really proud of, like something that, something that was really beautiful and useful and something that, I don't know, we could look back at and say like, hey, we're, we're so proud to have built something like that that people use. And I think that, that sort of shows in products. I, I think there's... There are almost two kinds of startups that I see all the time. There are people that are they're deeply motivated by disrupting markets. Um, you know, they, they see markets, they see inefficiencies, they see um, I don't know. They they see the way the technology can can disrupt those. Uh, one of our investors, Kevin Hartz, right? Like he he disrupted Eventbrite. You know, Eventbrite. He disrupted remittance payments with Zoom. Um, and then there are these other startups where people just really want to see something in the world that they'd really love to, to have. And those are a little bit different. Those are harder to assess. Uh, I think at the investment stage, they're harder to measure the, the value of, especially early on. Um, and I think we're definitely in that, that second camp. What, what, when you, when you talk about, you talked about earlier that the original product that you had was nowhere near the vision uh, for what you, uh, for what you guys had of it was, what, what do you see, what is the, what does the future of Pinterest look like? And 
how does that align with your original vision? Are you still on track with your original vision? Have you guys hit it? Um, or at what, what's like the percentage of, of where the product is today to where your, your actual vision is of where it should go? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think probably every startup founder has this, like they can barely look at their own product. Right? Like, they're like, oh my God, like what's wrong with that? Like why is that not loading? Why is that not caching right? Like what is, what is going on there? And I think I'm definitely a little bit like that. I, I probably am too much like that. Um, I don't know, I always tell the team that someday when you open Pinterest, it, you should feel emotionally connected to it. It should feel like somebody kind of handmade this, this catalog for you and it should make you feel closer to all of the things that you aspire to do and that's not really a vision that's constrained to a computer or a tablet or a phone it's more it's more of an emotional kind of response that we want to the product itself um, and I think we're really far away from that um, I think that's measured by how how quickly we can deliver that um, it's measured by how how well we can use the relationships between people and boards and pins to show people just what they want. Um, it's related to the technology itself. How can we make the site incredibly fast on every device? Um, how can we make the interactions feel really like natural and, and beautiful? Um, so I think we're really, really far away from it. Um, but I think it's a nice. It's nice to have a little bit of a north star to point point you to and. Um, how you get there, I guess, is sort of the fun. What is it like being at Pinterest right now? Like, what it, what is it like over the last, it seems like over the last four or five months, it's gone from being, you know, a fairly popular site to like, just kind of like crazy town. Not, not, not you guys aren't crazy, but just like, just there's so much hype and buzz around it. And there's so many more people joining the site. What, what is this period like for you guys as, as the founders and as, as uh, employees? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for all the employees. I mean, I know for me, it's it's a combination of being really excited. Um, it's it's a weird feeling, right? You're working on this thing and all of a sudden, like, people people have heard of it and they're using it. Uh, it's also scary, uh, at least to me, I don't know. Um, I, always, I always watch these interviews with, like, Jack Dorsey uh, and Kevin Systrom, and they're just, they're, like, so confident. <laughs> Uh, and I actually really envy that. Um, it's a little bit scary, right? You, I mean, I've never done it before, and I think a lot of times you you stress about a lot of small decisions. Um, and as far as the team, um, I don't know, our team is awesome. Uh, I, I'm sure everyone feels that way. I feel genuinely fortunate to work with, work with some of these people. I think we selected really aggressively um, for a few attributes. I, I loved Google. Um, but at Google, there was definitely the feeling that it was engineering was how the whole company would run. Um, and that served them incredibly well, right? I mean, if we were fractionally as successful as Google, we'd be really successful. Um, but I think we knew from the beginning that we were building a very different kind of product, uh, a product that required a different type of discipline. Um, and that's okay. I think a lot of people feel this need to replicate uh, Facebook's culture in the early days or Google's culture or Apple's culture. But, but the culture and the people that you bring together, like they reflect the product that you're trying to build, right? The, the two are inextricably like linked. And for us, we're trying to build these three functions at the same time. We want to build a, a world-class engineering organization. Uh, we want to build an amazing design organization. And we want to build a great community, um, a group of people that can understand, um, are people happy on the site? How do, we, how do we understand the dynamics of what's going on? And those, those three groups, they, they actually sit on totally equal footing. Um, it's funny, I always tell the engineers, I was like, I value engineering. I mean, no one's gonna dispute how important you are, but I kind of think of it like the chefs in a restaurant. Like, they're really important, but there are these other really important people that make the experience of going to a restaurant really amazing. And I think that's, that's a lot about our product. Um, I probably wouldn't say the same thing if, if you were building a hardcore infrastructure product, but it's definitely true for us. And you, how, how many people are working at Pinterest right now? We may have just crossed 20, 20 people. Okay. Um, an awful lot of them are new. So um, it's really exciting. Uh, it's so fun. I just walk into the office and I don't know. We, we had this great moment where we were reviewing a candidate um, and we were talking about what was working and you know what, 
why this candidate was great and other things that we were concerned about. And I had this amazing realization that, that I, I don't think I could get hired at my own company anymore. <laughs> uh, and it felt really good. It felt awesome. I mean, I was like, this is, this is amazing. Um, and so we also try to hire people that take genuine joy in the success of the people around them and are willing to hire people way better than them for the opportunity to learn. Um, and that's, that's something that doesn't exist actually in every person that you, you speak with. So I talked to a, in, an early engineer at Pinterest, and he talked about meeting you guys. This was like in late 2010, uh, meeting you and your co-founders. And, um, and he talked about how, it, and I, the, the, where this is going is to, to just ask you about uh, early stages hiring and what you, how you would suggest they go about doing that or how you did it. But what, one thing that he said was really interesting about it, what he, why he ended up joining you guys was that you were totally open with your metrics. Like you just comp like you met with him in a coffee shop and you were like, "This is what we got," and and he was really like he just felt like um, that kind of openness and you know that you know that that really made an impact on him. He liked you guys as well, but but it was you know it was this feeling of, "Hey, if I come here, I can," you know these these are guys that I don't know, but you know they're the, the whole thing is completely open. We can try whatever and, and do it. Well, what 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 would be your advice? For startups today who are competing with, you know, a Pinterest or Facebook or Google, what what do you do to what 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 would you do to hire? What would you do to, you know, to find a, a co-founder? How would you go about solving that problem? Yeah, I, I think the the most important thing when you're working with people early is that you guys line up on on what your goals are. Um, that's that's really that sounds really basic, but you can totally. It can be fine. You can want to build a small business um, that makes money and you don't have to go to an office every day. Or you can want to build a huge company. You can want to build Google. But I think you have to be really, really aligned on that. And I think you have to, that's one thing. You have to, you have to communicate in the same way. Like there, there are lots of people who just don't communicate in the same way with each other. They, they talk at different levels or they're really abrasive. And, if, and that, that'll wear, I think. Um, and then you have to trust people um, innately. Right? If you can't, like there's so many external variables that could go wrong that if you don't even trust the person that you're in it with, I think it's, it's not gonna work. So yeah, those are, those are probably the three things that I care about. How, how, important is it, how important is web versus mobile to you guys? It seems like everyone is talking about mobile, 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 and you guys have built this incredible web-based platform. You obviously you have mobile apps in your mobile, but how how important how important is it to you all in terms of resources and time and uh, mobile is incredibly important. I mean, it's just we want to build a service that's relevant to people wherever they are, and people have their phones, and now they have tablets, and soon their TVs will be enabled. But but mobile is obviously dominant. So I don't know if you're building a technology company, you have to build it for the technology that's that's present, right? You can't be biased about it. Um, and the numbers speak for themselves. Like mobile is absolutely the most important platform right now. Just, I, don't I, don't, I don't think that you could make any, any other argument um, for most consumer services. Let, let's take two or three questions from the audience and then, and then we're gonna wrap up. Does anyone have a, a good question? And please, you know, keep this uh, relevant to the whole group. Yeah, right there. So what did you see in terms of competitors and who are you compared to early on? Yeah, there were two categories, I think. Um, I think there were sites that were visual. And I know that sounds extremely generic, but I think a lot of investors literally lumped every site that was primarily visual, meaning that the like percentage of screen real estate devoted to images was probably like 4x devoted to text into the same bucket. Um, so that was one category. And then I think the second category um, were bookmarking sites. Um, we thought the idea of boards was really important. Like we've never called it an image bookmarking site. We've never called it a visual bookmarking site. We've always said like pins are their own object. They're supposed to be the best digital representation of an object that there is. They're supposed to confer like what it means to you, why it's relevant to you, where it came from, who it influenced, who cared about it. 
And for each individual pin, it means something different when it's on Pinterest than if it's just a bookmark, right? So your iPhone could be um, the most beautiful products ever made, or it could be the things in my pocket every day, or it could be um, the things that I want to buy when I have uh, another paycheck, right? Those are very different contexts, and we always thought that there was something deeply meaningful about that. Um, but it was really hard to separate that from separate kind of the long-term goal of what the product is from what people see, especially visually. Um, but those were the categories. Yeah, right there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So how, how are you guys thinking about monetization and how important it, is it to you at this point? I mean, I think that right now growth is very important to us, but monetization is very important, right? Google couldn't go around driving cars and taking pictures of every street <laughs> if they weren't making a lot of money. And I hope at least that Pinterest can be, I think it'd be cool to work there my whole life, right? So monetization matters like a ton. Um, we haven't really focused on it at all. Um, we put in sort of uh, a JavaScript-based affiliate code for a while to understand how people were using the service. And we wanted to know, hey, are people pinning things that are totally aspirational? Are they things that are core to their life? But it wasn't like a dedicated effort. Um, I think that when we choose to monetize, it will be based on the core tenets of the site, which is helping you discover things you love. Um, and I think if we build the place that people go and trust and emotionally kind of confide in when they're trying to identify the things that they want to do in their life or the places that they want to go or the things that they want to cook or the things they want to make, I think we'll be, we'll be in a good spot. Anyone else? Okay, let's take one more. So the question is what? How are, P how are marketers, how are marketers using Pinterest or are? Okay. People trying to market on the site, does that interfere with what you're doing and the revenue that you could make? So I guess we think of it at a slightly higher level, right? The, the goal, is that when you join the site, you should see things that you love, right? And if you don't love marketing or if you don't love spam, no one loves spam, you shouldn't see it. We're agnostic about taste. Like some people might see a cupcake and be like, oh, I hate cupcakes, I'm so offended by that cupcake. Or see, you know, um, kind of photos that they find shocking or see products that they hate. And our job as a company is always to show you the things that you really love and connect you to the people that found them. And I think as long as we sort of continue to drive towards that goal, um, hopefully we'll just get better and better at that. I think, I think the analogy is a specific tactic designed to circumvent Google, right? Google's goal is always going to be to show you the most relevant content based upon the query that you inputted, and that's always going to be their high-level goal. Um, and then there are people that will try to work around it, but they're always working to improve that sort of high-level objective. Can we give Ben a big round of applause? <laughs> Thanks, Thanks,